let's learn about constructing and using analytic, in other words, symbolic antiderivatives or antiderivatives if you prefer. Number one says, which of the following functions that you see, choices A through F, are antiderivatives of the function f of x equals 1 over x. We've talked about antiderivatives already. An antiderivative of a function is a function whose derivative is the given function. So we're looking for which of these functions has a derivative equal to 1 over x. Some have that property and some don't. Choice A definitely does. We know from facts about derivatives that the derivative of the natural log of x equals 1 over x. The derivative with respect to x of natural log of x is 1 over x, and that is enough to imply that natural log of x is an antiderivative of 1 over x. Natural log of x is an antiderivative of 1 over x, again, because its derivative is 1 over x. I'm not using indefinite integral notation here. That will come up in problem number two. What about choice B? Is that an antiderivative of 1 over x? Is its derivative 1 over x? No, it's not. The derivative of negative 1 over x squared is the same as the derivative with respect to x of negative x to the negative 2 power. You bring down that negative 2 and subtract one from that exponent, you're not going to get 1 over x. What will you get? You'll get positive 2 x to the negative 3 which is the same as positive 2 over x cubed, not 1 over x. Therefore, negative 1 over x squared is not an antiderivative of 1 over x. It's not, okay? The derivative of negative 1 over x squared is not 1 over x. The integral, antiderivative of a negative 1 over x squared, is 1 over x. That's why it might be a little confusing to you. Choice C is natural log of x plus natural log of 3, the particular number 3. Natural log of 3 is a constant. Its derivative is 0. So natural log of x plus 3 has a derivative equal to 1 over x plus 0. 1 over x. Choice C is. C is. I'll abbreviate now. Choice A is. Choice B is not, choice C is. What about choice D? Doesn't look like it, does it? The derivative of natural log of 2x? How could that possibly be an antiderivative of 1 over x? But choice D is, the derivative of natural log of 2x can be found in a couple ways and seen to equal 1 over x. One way to do it is with the chain rule. The 2x is the inside function, the natural log of x is the outside function. The chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function, the natural log of x, which is 1 over x, but then plug in the inside function, and then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. The 2's then cancel, leaving you with 1 over x. Another way to see that natural log of 2x is an antiderivative of 1 over x is to realize that natural log of 2x, by a property of logarithms, is natural log of x plus natural log of 2 and natural log of 2 is a constant. It's similar to choice uh, to choice C, this one here, where C is. So D is. All right, what about choice E? Natural log of x plus 1. Does that equal natural log of x plus natural log of 1? No, that's not a property of logarithms. Choice D, E is not. If you want to confirm it by differentiating, with the chain rule, the inside function is now x plus 1. You get 1 over x plus 1 times the derivative of x plus 1, which is 1. 1 over x plus 1, which is not 1 over x. Choice E is not. Finally, choice F, natural log of the absolute value of x. Careful, you need to think about this as a piecewise function. Natural log of the absolute value of x equals certainly natural log of x if x is positive because the absolute value of a positive number is itself and it's the natural log of negative x if x is negative. That's a little confusing. When x is a negative number like negative 5 or something then negative x is actually a positive number which leads some math teachers to not call that negative x but call it the opposite of x instead of negative x because it's confusing. 
If x is negative 5, its opposite, its additive inverse, is positive 5. Negative of negative 5 is positive 5. So natural log of absolute value of x equals this function when x is negative. So what is the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x? Both of these functions over these individual domains are continuous and, in fact, differentiable. We can differentiate them. Natural log of x differentiates to 1 over x if x is positive. And natural log of negative x differentiates by the chain rule to 1 over negative x times negative 1, which is 1 over x if x is negative. In other words, the derivative of natural log of x is indeed 1 over x. Choice f is, OK? The domains of these functions are different. The domains of choice a, c, and d, which were antiderivatives of 1 over x, is only positive values of x. The domain of choice x in, of choice f includes negative values of x as well, but not x equals 0. Finally, the last part of the problem says find an antiderivative capital F of x of this same function, 1 over x, satisfying the condition that capital F of 1 equals 4. Here it might be worthwhile to introduce indefinite integral notation in this video. The most general antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of the absolute value of x plus an arbitrary constant c. Okay, the domain of 1 over x includes both positive and negative numbers. We really want the domain of the antiderivative to include both positive and, neg and negative numbers, so we go ahead and we include the absolute value signs there. Adding on an arbitrary constant gives you what you might call the most general antiderivative. Actually, that's a little bit of a lie because you could use different constants on different parts of the domain, but it's good enough for most applications. We could call this capital F of x, and we want capital F of 1 to equal 4. Can we choose c so that happens? Yeah. Plug in x equals 1. We get natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus c. We want that to be set equal to 4, and we want to solve for c. Absolute value of 1 is, zero, is 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. Therefore, c is 4. And we get an answer. Capital F of x equals natural log of the absolute value of x plus 4. Four. Now, actually, to truth be told, you could also write an answer that does not involve the absolute value of x. But this would be a general function that satisfies that, that would have a domain equal to positive values of x and negative values of x. Just like with derivatives, if you're going to get good at doing integrals, it is useful to do some memorization. That's what problem two is about. Write down the most fundamental antiderivatives, indefinite integrals, to memorize. Maybe you already know these. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but maybe you don't. So what's the first one? The first one is the reverse, you might say, of the power rule. The power rule for derivatives tells you how to differentiate x to the n. What about integrating x to the n? I'm writing an integral symbol there without limits of integration. This is an indefinite integral. It's after, like we saw at the end of the last problem, the most general antiderivative of this. Since when you take derivative of the derivative of x to the n, you bring down the n and you get n times x to the n minus 1, you subtract that exponent, 1 from that exponent, you kind of do the reverse here. Instead of subtracting 1 from the exponent, you add 1 to the exponent. Instead of multiplying by the exponent, you divide by it. Then add c. That's the answer. However, there is a catch here. Something a little tricky. Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. What happens when n equals negative 1? You'd be dividing by 0. This formula can't possibly work. Well, when n equals negative 1, that's the example in the last problem. The antiderivative of x to the negative 1, 1 over x, is, as we saw in the last problem, the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. So this is only true if n is negative 1, not equal to negative 1. And then when n does equal negative 1, you get this. This works even if n is not a whole number, even if it's a fraction. For example, uh, x to the integral of x to the 1 half power, which is the same as the integral of the square root of x, would be x to the 3 halves power divided by 3 halves plus c, which you could simplify to 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus c. You could also have x to the pi power, and you get x to the pi plus 1 divided by pi plus 1 plus c. All that kind of stuff works. 
This works for any real number n except n equals negative 1. And when n equals negative 1, this is what you get. I also should mention that this applies by what's called linearity of the integral to polynomials. For example, if you want to integrate uh, x squared plus 4x plus 3, you can effectively integrate each piece with this rule here. You, if you want to write it symbolically, you could say do the integral of x squared plus the integral of 4x, and the 4 can be factored out in front of the integral as well, plus the integral of 3. And this rule here, in this case, when n is 2, is going to give you 1 3rd x cubed. We'll just add the plus c at the very end. This one, if we pull the 4 out in front, we'd be integrating x to the first power. We get x squared over 2. Times 4, that ends up giving us um, 2x squared. And you can double check that by differentiation. Here, it's like 3 times x to the 0 power. This even works when x is 0, because then n plus 1 is 1. And you divide by 1. You get 3 times x to the first power, or just 3x. And now add on your plus c at the end. So you can apply this with polynomials. You can also apply it with any linear combination of any kind of power function. What else is worth memorizing? It's certainly worth memorizing that the integral of e to the x is uh, e to the x plus c, right? Because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Isn't that a great fact from calculus? A little bit more generally, the integral of an arbitrary exponential function, b to the x, where b is a base bigger than 0 and uh, not equal to 1. Actually, this works even if the base is 1. Uh, gives you b to the x divided by natural log, actually it doesn't work when b is 1, excuse me, divided by natural log of b plus c. It wouldn't work when b is 1 because then you get natural log of 1, which is 0, you'd be dividing by 0. If b is 1, you got 1 to the x, which is really just 1, you're really just integrating 1, and you get x plus c. It's really a power function uh, with n equal to 0 in that case. Next integrals to memorize are integrals of trig functions. The derivative of, co of sine is cosine. Therefore, the indefinite integral of cosine is sine plus c. Don't forget your plus c. Since the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the integral of sine is negative cosine. It's a little confusing, right? You got to think about the derivative facts. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Therefore, the integral of cosine of x is sine of x plus c. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. Therefore, if I integrate sine of x without a negative sign, I've got to have a negative sign there. So yeah, it's a little confusing. The next one to memorize related to trig functions is a little strange. Integral of secant squared x, which is the same as, by definition of secant, the integral of 1 over cos squared x dx. That looks like it would be very difficult. How are you in the world are you going to find a an antiderivative of secant squared? Well, it's a memorization thing. It's actually fairly simple. It's tangent of x plus c, because the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared, 1 over cosine squared. You can derive that with the quotient rule if you want. Okay, It is a fundamental fact to, to memorize. Uh, interesting related fact is that if you try to integrate just a plain secant of x or secant cubed or any other power of secant, it gets much harder, though often doable still with some tricks. Okay, that's for a calculus two class. All right, what else should we do? What else should we memorize? Um, here's kind of a strange one. What's the well? What's the derivative of inverse tangent of x? One over one plus x squared. Therefore, the integral of one over one plus x squared, which looks hard. How in the world can you find a function whose derivative is 1 over 1 plus x squared? Well, I just said it. It's inverse tangent of x plus c. Or if you prefer, you could call that arctangent of x plus c because inverse tangent of x and arctangent are the same function. And by the way, tan inverse tangent of x, you should say inverse tangent. Do not say tangent to the negative 1 power because that's not a power there. I know that's inconsistent with usual notation. If you meant tangent of x to the negative 1 power, you'd actually write it as cotangent of x. C O T. So it's funny notation, but it is what we're stuck with. This is not tangent of x to the negative one power. It's it's not cosine divided by sine. It's not cotangent. It's also called an arctangent. And maybe that's why that's maybe a little bit better notation. Anyway, this is an integral to memorize. What about the integral of another inverse trig function? Uh, well, 
related to the derivative of inverse trig, trig function, the derivative of inverse sine is 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. Therefore, the integral of 1, uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is the inverse sine of x plus c. You could also call that the arc sine of x plus c. Again, this does not mean sine of x to the negative 1 power. If you meant sine of x to the negative 1 power, you would write it as cosecant of x, csc of x. Inverse sine, also called the arc sine function, is the answer there. It's actually, there's actually another way to write this. You could also write it as negative of inverse cosine of x plus c, because the derivative of inverse cosine of x is this thing with a negative sign in front, amazingly. That would be the negative of arc cosine of x plus c. Uh, by the way, in saying these things are equal, the c's actually would be different. Um, inverse sine of x does not equal negative inverse cosine of x. Uh, they differ by a constant. So it's a little funny in writing this, but I'll go ahead and do so. And I would say these are the main antiderivatives to memorize. Some people might also memorize the integral of ln of x, for example. It's x times ln of x minus x plus c. A little tricky. Technically, you want to derive that with something called integration by parts. And a few people might argue there's other ones you could memorize, but I think these are the most fundamental. In problem number three, we're going to evaluate some indefinite integrals, find some antiderivatives, most general antiderivatives, based on number two, the memorized ones, but with some twists, some trickiness involved, like constants in front, the four there, the six there, a fraction involving square roots, that looks hard right there, and hmm, this is kind of similar to the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared, but this 25 seems to be putting a wrench into things. Now, there's an official method you can use to help you solve these problems called substitution. Some books call it u substitution, some books call it w substitution, but I want to avoid that for this video. I want to just focus on guessing. Not just wild guessing, but educated guessing. We're trying to integrate in part a, 4 times sine of 3t dt. Okay, I'm calling the variable t here instead of x. It's not a big deal. We know, <coughs> excuse me, that the integral of sine of t dt by what we wrote on the previous page is negative cosine of t plus c. So the answer here should involve a cosine and a negative sine in front. What do you do with the 4? The 4, just like with the polynomial, can be sort of brought along for the ride. So I'm going to start to write negative 4 here, but there's a little bit of a catch because there's also a 3 inside there. I hope it makes some intuitive sense that we should include a 3 inside there into the argument of the cosine there. But this, as it stands, can't possibly be the answer. Negative 4 times cosine of 3t plus c can't possibly be the answer because if you differentiate it, the 3 kind of messes things up. With the chain rule, you get an extra factor of 3 outside the cosine, which you don't see here. So how do you compensate for that? When you differentiate this, you multiply by 3. So to compensate, to make it cancel, divide by 3 as well. There we go. Educated guessing, that does work. And you can always check your answer. If we differentiate this, you always can check your answer, and you always should check your answer. We get negative 4 thirds. I'll carry that along. The derivative of cosine of 3t would be negative sine of 3t, then by the chain rule, times 3. The 3's cancel. The negative signs cancel, leaving you with 4 sine of 3t, exactly the integrand function that you see here, exactly the function that we're trying to find the most general antiderivative for, and yes, include your plus c with indefinite integrals. Moving on to part b, integrate 6e to the negative 2t dt, again, with educated guessing. We know the integral of e to the t dt is e to the t plus c, so the answer has got to involve e to some power, e to the t, no, it's got to involve e to the negative 2t. You have, to, you have to have a negative 2t there if you're going to get a negative 2t there when you differentiate this. Should I put the 6 in front? Sure. Maybe kind of like this. This is kind of similar to the fact that there was a 3 there, made us divide by 3 there. There's a negative 2 here making us, yes, divide by negative 2 here to compensate when we differentiate. Simplify a little bit. 
get negative 3 e to the negative 2t plus c. Check it by differentiating d dt. Negative 3 gets carried along. e to the negative 2t times negative 2 plus c differentiates to 0, giving us 6 e to the negative 2t. Exactly the function we're integrating, the integrand function, exactly the function we were trying to find the most general antiderivative for. What about c? Integrate x squared plus square root of x over x. Yikes. Wasn't on the previous page as something to memorize, certainly. Um, you can use the fact that a fraction where the numerator is the sum of two things or the difference of two things and the denominator is not can be split up into two fractions like this. Actually, even if the denominator were more than one term, if it was like an x plus 5 or something, I could still include x plus 5 and x plus 5 here and here. Why does that work? It's how to add fractions in reverse. If you added these two fractions, they already have a common denominator, so you add their numerators and you keep the denominator the same. We're breaking the fraction apart. There is an integration method called partial fractions that's kind of similar to this, but not exactly the same. Uh, that's more advanced. How is that helpful? Because now you can use properties of exponents to simplify these things. x squared over x to the first is x to the 2 minus 1, just x, right? One of the x's cancels. Square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half power. This is the same as x to the first. If we subtract the exponents, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. All right. And yeah, linearity works. I can write this. You don't have to write this step, but if you want to, you can. And then each of these is a power function. We can use the first rule from problem number two, the inverse reverse of the power rule. n is 1 in this case, so we get x squared over 2. n is negative 1 half in this case, so we get x to the positive 1 half over positive 1 half. n plus 1 would be positive 1 half. Plus c, add the c at the end. Simplify a little bit. 1 half x squared plus dividing by 1 half is the same as multiplying by 2 and x to the 1 half is the same as square root of x plus c. Now truth be told, uh, there is a little bit of a caveat we could mention here. The domain of the original function here is only positive numbers not including 0 because you'd be dividing by 0. Whereas the domain of this function in, is all positive numbers and also 0 because you can plug in 0 into this. So it, technically speaking the equality between these two things is only when x is strictly positive. And now the last part of part D part this problem, part D there, is to integrate 1 over 1 plus 25x squared. Yeah, if that 25 were not there, it'd be easy. It would be inverse tangent of x plus c. Well, the 25 is there. How can we guess? This one's a bit trickier, I think. It's good to write 25x squared as 5x quantity squared. Okay, why? Well, writing inverse tangent of, of 5x with some unspecified constant here is the best initial guess. Why? Plus c. Because if you differentiate this, leave some space there again, leave some space here, you're going to get 1 over, by the chain rule, 1 plus 5x quantity squared then times the derivative of 5x is times 5. And that becomes 25x squared, just like that. How do you deal with the 5 there when there's no 5 there? You need a 1 -fifth in front here, and that means we also need a 1 -fifth in front here. I was checking by differentiating here. And the 5s cancel, and this simplifies to 1 over 1 plus 25x squared. So here is the answer, and again, you can also write it as one-fifth arctangent. In fact, I prefer that notation personally. A 5x plus c would be another way to write the answer because inverse tangent and arctangent are the same function. Our last three problems are going to involve using integrals to do things and to use the integrals we need to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and we need antiderivatives. Part A of number four says find the exact average value 
of the square root function on the interval from 4 to 9. Illustrate your answer with a graph of this function. Let's go ahead and do that first. So what is average value? Average value of f on an interval from a to b, assuming f is continuous, so that the integral exists, you can actually get away with assuming it's discontinuous at finitely many points, for example. But it's 1 over b minus a times the integral of f from a to b. So for the given example, the function is the square root of x, which is x to the 1 half power. That'll help us use the reverse of the power rule. And the interval is 4 to 9. a is 4, b is 9. So this becomes 1 over 9 minus 4 times the integral from 4 to 9 of x to the 1 half dx. Now use the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to get 1 fifth times. What do we need? We need an antiderivative of x to the 1 half. That's x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. And is 1 half there. Dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. You can double check by differentiating that the derivative of that is going to be x to the 1 half. This gets evaluated from 4 to 9. Standard notation here. Simplify 1 fifth times 2 thirds is 2 fifteenths. 2 fifteenths. We go 9 to the 3 halves minus 4 to the 3 halves. You can figure this out nicely. 9 to the 3 halves is the square root of 9 cubed. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 cubed is 27. 4 to the 3 halves is the square root of 4 cubed. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. 27 minus 8 is 19. 2 times 19 is 38. 38 over 15 looks to be the average value of the function. What is that approximately? It's approximately 2.5, well, exactly 2.53 with a 3 repeating would be an exact formula for that. Interpret this, illustrate it with a graph. I've talked about this in some recent videos, how to interpret average value. If you graph the square root function over the interval from 4 to 9, its value at 4 is 2. Square root of 4 is 2. Its value at 9 is 3. Well, let's put 2 a little higher there. 2 and 3. It is a concave down function. The integral of this function gives you the area under the curve. Turns out the average value of the function is the height of a rectangle so that the area under the horizontal line at the top of the rectangle is the same as the area under the curve. 2.53 repeating is slightly above halfway between 2 and 3, slightly above 2.5. So a rectangle about like this has the same area as the area under the curve. Of course, you can't draw pictures perfectly but relatively decent. The fact that this graph is concave down is the geometric reason why the average value is going to be slightly higher than halfway between the extremes, 2 and 3. It's slightly higher than 2.5. If it had been concave up, the average value would have been slightly lower than 2.5 if it went from 2 to 3 as x goes from 4 to 9. Um, intuitively, if you sort of imagine the x-axis as being time, it's like the graph spends more time in higher values than in lower values, and that's an intuitive reason why the average value is slightly higher than, again, 2.5 in this case. Part B. Find the exact area between two graphs. Find the exact area between the graphs of y equals x squared and y equals 2 minus x squared. Let's draw those graphs to get our bearings here. y equals x squared your standard parabola looks like this. y equals 2 minus x squared. Well, minus x squared would be an upside down parabola. It would be the reflection of this across the x-axis. 2 minus x squared is going to take that graph and shift it up by two units. So y equals 2 minus x squared might look about like this. The area between them is this area right there that you see. If we're going to find that area, we need to figure out the intersection points. We need to set x squared equal to 2 minus x squared and solve for x. That's easier 
and then it might look at first. 2x squared is 2. We don't need the quadratic formula. That means x squared is 1. So x is plus or minus 1. Nice simple numbers there for where these curves intersect. Negative 1 and positive 1, and their values, their outputs there are also 1. To find the area between the curves, it's pretty intuitive. The area between is going to be the integral over the interval in question, negative 1 to 1 in this case, of the difference, the higher function minus the lower function. Careful, the higher function over this interval is 2 minus x squared. 2 minus x squared minus the lower function, which is the x squared function. Over that interval, this one's on top, and this one's on the bottom. Okay, that's the trickiest part. Most commonplace people make mistakes. Simplify this, you get uh, 2 minus 2x squared. This should be a positive number. We're talking about a positive area between things. Antiderivative of this can be done in pieces. The antiderivative of 2x of 2 is 2x. Antiderivative of minus 2x squared would be, careful, minus 2 thirds x cubed, right? Different, check that by differentiation. Evaluate this from negative 1 to 1. We could also use the fact that this is an even function. We could do the integral from 0 to 1 and double it. Anyway, doing it as we're doing it here, we're going to get 2 minus 2 thirds minus, in parentheses, negative 2 plus 2 thirds, right? You got to be careful here. First, I'm plugging in x equals 1 in both spots. Subtracting what I get when I plug in x equals negative 1, you got to be careful with signs. So this becomes, distributing the minus sign through here, 2 minus 2 thirds plus 2 minus 2 thirds gives 4 minus 4 thirds, getting a common denominator of 3. We get 12 minus 4 over 3, and that's 8 thirds, which is the same as 2.6 repeating for the area between those two curves. Number 5 is a motion problem. A bug moves to the right and then to the left along a number line, and I'm going to label the number line with x, with velocity given by this function right here, as time goes from 0 to 4, units are not given. I could have given units like maybe centimeters for the position and seconds for time. Rightward motion is a positive velocity and leftward motion is a negative velocity. To the right is positive, to the left is negative. If the bug starts at the origin at time 0, at what position is the bug when t equals 4? Also, what about if the bug starts at position 20 when t equals 0? Okay, we've talked about this in a previous video. The integral, the definite integral of the velocity over the interval in question gives you the change in position. If you add that to the starting position, then you get the final position. Change in position, change in position when you are given a velocity is the integral of that velocity. I'll write it in the gen general case here integral of v of t from a to b. If the velocity is actually a speed, meaning your motion is just in one direction, then the integral gives you the distance traveled as well. If in general you want to find the distance traveled and you're given the velocity, you have to integrate the absolute value of the velocity. So in the case in question, we're integrating from 0 to 4. The velocity function is 6t minus t cubed, which does go negative. It's rightward motion at first. It starts out when t is 0 that the velocity is 0, but then when t is slightly positive, this is a positive quantity. You can check it by plugging in numbers or graphing it. But when t is large enough, the graph of the velocity goes down. It's a cubic with a negative t cubed term. The graph of this velocity looks something like this when t is greater than or equal to 0 here. So it is both above and below the axis, rightward motion, then leftward motion. In the end, the final position could be either positive or negative. It's possible. Let's see what happens. Do the integral. Use uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, so we need an antiderivative of this. 6t, what is the antiderivative of t? It's t squared over 2. With the 6 there, 6 over 2 becomes 3, 3t three squared. Integral t cubed is going to be t to the fourth over 4, 1 fourth t to the fourth. We're evaluating this from 0 to 4. Fortunately, when you plug in 0, you get 0, so we can just plug in 4. 3 times 4 squared minus 1 fourth times 4 to the fourth. 4 squared 16. 16 times 3 is 48. 
uh, 1 fourth times 4 cubed is going to be 4 to the third. 4 to the third, let's see, 4 squared is 16, 4 cubed is 64, right? 16 times 4, yep, 64. And we're subtracting it. Negative 16 is the change in position. In other words, you end 16 units to the left of where you started, right where it is positive, left where it is negative. If we start at the origin at time zero, that means our position at time four is position negative 16 along the number line. Here's your number line, say. Zero's right there. Negative 16's over here. We went to the right a little bit, then we came back to the left and we ended at position negative 16. So for part A, uh, the position is negative 16 when t equals four, when starting at the origin. x equals zero, this is an x-axis here. If, in this, as in the second part, we start at position 20, over here, say, the change in position is still the integral of the velocity, still negative 16. But since we started right there, our final position is no longer negative 16, it's 16 units to the left of 20, which is position four. So, when starting at position x equals 20 when t equals 0, we end at position 4. I'll write it as 20 plus negative 16, the starting position plus the value of the definite integral, which is 4 at t equals 4. That's a coincidence that those are both 4s. Okay? So, kind of tricky, but you can definitely do it. Our last problem is kind of a strange but important economics problem. In drilling an oil well, the total cost C consists of two parts. Fixed costs, independent of the depth of the well, that would be, you know, setting up all the machinery and that kind of thing, and also maybe labor costs, and marginal costs, which depend on the depth, how far down do you drill. Drilling becomes more expensive per meter deeper into the earth. The further down you dig, the harder it gets to dig, I guess, or maybe you need fancier equipment or something. It gets harder and harder. It gets more and more costly. You need more material, if nothing else. Suppose the fixed costs are 1 million riles, that's the unit of currency in Saudi Arabia, and the marginal costs are given by, hmm, C prime of X. I thought the marginal cost was part of C. It's a little tricky in how it's phrased. Yes, yeah, C prime of X, that is a derivative. It's this formula in riles per meter. It depends on X, the depth, and it is a derivative of C. C is going to be an antiderivative of this. Notice the units are riles per meter, not just plain riles. Kind of strange. So, for each, what, what's the graph of this and what does it mean? If you graph this function, got a vertical intercept of 5,000, slope of 2, which on this scale would be very hardly noticeable. It would almost look horizontal, but I'll, I'll make it look so it's got a slightly positive slope there. As x increases, the marginal cost increases, which means effectively the extra cost per extra meter keeps going up. When x is zero, when you first start drilling, it costs about 5,000 riles to drill the, the first meter. When x is larger, like say 100, well, do it, I don't need a calculator, when x is 100, when you're down 100 meters, 20 times x, 20 times 100 is uh, 2,000, plus 5,000 is 7,000. When you're down 1,000 meters, or 100 meters, it costs about 7,000 riles for the next meter. That's what this means. Okay, x is the depth of meters. Goal is to find the total cost of drilling the wheel, well x meters deep. It's using an arbitrary x there, which makes this even more confusing. They could have used a particular value of x there, like, I don't know, 1,000 or something. That could have been done, but it hasn't been done. So, we want to find a formula for C as a function of X. That's the goal here. It really is the fundamental theorem of calculus and also realizing we need to represent this cost as, um, as an integral where the upper limit of the integral is really your variable. 
it's your fixed cost, one million, which is the same as C of zero, plus the integral from zero to x of the derivative of C. I'm really just using the fundamental theorem of calculus here. I could subtract C of zero from both sides. I could write C of x minus C of zero. C of x is an antiderivative of C prime, is the integral from zero to x. It doesn't matter that x is not specified. I could use a specific x, but it doesn't matter. Integral of the derivative. But if I'm using an x there, should I use an x there? Well, sometimes people are sloppy and they do, but I think it's a bad idea. You should use something other than x. And for fun, I'm going to use my favorite Greek letter, xi. Xi? Yes, xi. It looks like this, and isn't that pretty? Some people call it squiggle, because it looks like a squiggle. But, and you can make it fast too, and it's kind of fun. But the official name of it is xi. I'm just doing it for fun, but I did want to use something other than x, okay? So c of x is going to be a million times the integral from zero to x of c prime of xi xi. So much fun to say too, and it's so pretty. Anyway, we can now use the fact that we can actually compute antiderivative of, make sure I got the right number of zeros here, this function to simplify this. Just pretend x is fixed. Plug in this function here, replacing x with xi. and then do it. Write down an antiderivative of this with respect to xi. It's 5,000 xi plus 10 xi squared evaluated from 0 to x. When you plug in 0, you'll get 0. So all we need to do is plug in x. And we do get a final answer that does depend on x. So we get 1 million plus 5,000x plus 10x squared. We get a quadratic whose graph is a parabola. So the total cost starts out at a million when you haven't dug anything. And as x increases, it's a parabola. And we would be past the vertex. It would be uh, concave up and actually have a positive slope initially. It would look about like this. It's not a straight line. It is concave up, and that's the big picture lesson of this problem. Thanks for watching.